Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com and celebrity spokesmodel for the ClassicsToday.com merchandise shop, where you can get all kinds of fabulous swag if you just follow the link posted in the description of this very video. Well, this particular very video is the result of a challenge issued to me by Mr. Francois Joubert of South Africa. He said to me, you know, he said, Dave, he said, I wish you'd do a video on the 10 most overrated recordings ever in the universe, in the galaxy, and whatever it is. He said, I'll bet you could do that in a minute. Well, I have to be honest, I couldn't do it in a minute. It took me about five minutes, but I made the list. I couldn't resist. I mean, how could I resist that particular suggestion? Thank you, Francois. That was just a wonderful suggestion. And here is my list. Now, I have to be clear about one thing. Overrated doesn't mean bad. Sometimes it means bad. I mean, something can be terrible and overrated, but often it just means overrated. Some of these recordings are excellent. They're just overrated. I mean, that's more even, that's even more likely. You're much more likely to exaggerate the quality of something that's basically good to begin with. And then you take it from there because then you don't have as much distance to travel in your overratedness, right? I mean, doesn't that make sense? So th these are not recordings that I think suck necessarily. Some of them I do, but you'll hear, you'll tell. There, this is in no order. And here's my list. I'm so excited. I mean, this is this is really the five funnest minutes I've had in a long time putting together this list. So we start with Carlos Kleiber's Beethoven Fifth. Where else could we begin? I mean, seriously, seriously, this Beethoven Fifth has been flogged, including by me as the reference recording in Beethoven 5s for like a billion years since the day it came out. But does anyone, does anyone truly seriously believe that in a piece that has been recorded so many times by so many great conductors with so many great orchestras that this particular performance is all that? I mean, really? Kleiber was the poster child for my contention that there's value in scarcity. The less he did, the more people wanted, the more he thing, he was anticipated. But, but more seriously, I think, for you know, music lovers, the more people were willing to just shut their brains off and say, oh, Kleiber, it must be fabulous. Well, some of it was, and some of it wasn't. He's like anybody else. This Beethoven Fifth is excellent. It's a first class Beethoven fifth, but to have it just exalted and worshiped and treated as the be all and end all in this piece, oh my heavens, that's silly. I mean, that's just completely silly. It's totally, completely the very definition of the overrated, excellent type recording. So I started with it because I think it's good to just Get it out of the way. Totally overrated. Completely hopelessly overrated. Next, Beecham's Scheherazade. The Thomas Beecham Scheherazade. I grew up with the British critics telling me over and over again that there was never a Scheherazade to match this Scheherazade. They knew all the players in the Royal Philharmonic by first name. It was, you know, oh, Reginald plays the bassoon like no one ever played the bassoon, and Freddie's oboe, and, and, and Anthony's clarinet. And I, I mean, it just was nauseating. And Beecham was wonderful in big, splashy, colorful, romantic pieces. He really was. But this Scheherazade is A, a little bit slow, a little bit on the soggy side. B, not all that well played in the finale, especially the brass section, corporately. 
Not that it doesn't have Reggie and Anthony and Tony or Freddie or whoever the hell they are on the solo woodwinds. They're fine. But, but you know, there's a whole orchestra out there that has to play together. And Beecham was, you know, sort of uh, maybe a little bit past his prime. And finally, it's not that well recorded. It has no bass. The climaxes are very constricted. It's just not that great a Scheherazade. Sorry. And to have it to have it extolled like crazy over over fabulous Scheherazades like Markevich and Ormandy and 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 you know Scheherazade people's Scheherazade like Stakowski and I don't know. No. Just no, sorry, nice try. No. Overrated, completely overrated. Good, but overrated. Then there are overrated performances that absolutely, completely and utterly suck the biggie and people just love them and there's no accounting for it. The ultimate, and you know which one it's going to be, Fort Vangler's Nazi, the ninth. Yes, Beethoven's ninth, the Fort Vangler version. I'm not even putting my tie on for the rest of it. I mean, there's just no point. It's awful. It's a scandal. It's a travesty. The performance is slovenly beyond belief. The recorded sound is wretched. It's basically turned into a timpani and percussion concerto wherever those instruments play. It's not because, you know, Hitler was there or he might have been there or it was three days after Hitler was there or, you know, people know everything about this performance, every single quotidian detail about what the date was and what happened was and how Fort Wengler felt and what his angst was because it was World War II and because, and because Nazis were flapping around and it, 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 they know everything except what Beethoven's Ninth is supposed to sound like and why this performance sounds so bad, completely bad. The playing is just wretched and, ah, goodness, how it, it's just beyond belief. But this is, you know, the classical music world is full of this. It's full of really, really bad performances that, that groups of people um, have given a sort of cult status to. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's out there. We keep hearing about it. People are passionate. Oh, my goodness. When I did my video about this performance, oh, the hate mail I got and I expected. Oh, the joy I had deleting people permanently from this channel so that I never have to deal with them and their befuddled tastes again. It was delicious. It's one of the best things I ever did in terms of cleaning out the Augean stables of 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 classical music lunacy. It really was. So the Fort Fangler, Beethoven Ninth from 1942 or whatever year it was. Yeah, forget it. Next, the Br Bruno Walter, Kathleen Ferrier, Julius Patzek, Vienna Philharmonic, Mahler das Lied von der Erde. Now, this runs up against a whole concatenation of overratedness. First, Walter conducted the premiere. I mean, about Dov das Lied von der Erde. He had undoubted authority, and his best version of it, as I have recently pointed out, was his New York Philharmonic version with Ernst Hefliger and Mildred Miller. Nothing comes close to that. There is his earlier one, the Vienna Live one, with, who was it, Kirsten Thorborg and, and someone else? I, I don't even remember. Charles Coleman, maybe? I don't know. I can't, I can't be bothered to even look because they, they suck. I mean, the sound is atrocious and, it, you know, there's just no reason to listen to them anymore. But this one, this one is in decent mono. The Vienna Philharmonic at this time in the 50s, mid 50s was scruffy. Kathleen Ferrier sounds awful. She's tremulous. She like, you know, gets some of the words wrong, some of the notes wrong. I mean, there's just... She's she's really not in good shape, and I feel bad for her. She was sick. She died tragically of cancer. She had a, a sad, sad career. But that's no excuse. What matters is how things sound. And because she died, and because she was, you know, the thing, oh, something the Brits love, they just love people who are sick and die for art, particularly women. 
I mean, you know, Puccini, Puccini's little girls, you know, who suffer for love and then drop dead. Mimi and La Boheme and, and you know, Chocho San and Madame Butterfly. You know, Kathleen Ferrier was sort of the Madame Butterfly of the singing world. And, and everyone is so sappy and sentimental about her. And I feel, again, it's not the issue. The issue is, how's the performance? Well, I mean, the Vienna Philharmonic, like I said, is, is scruffy at this point. Uh, Julius Patzek was a Heldon tenor who was well past his prime. And Ferrier is Ferrier. I mean, Walter knows how the piece goes. It's not his best conducting of it. It's not terrible, but overrated. I mean, it's just a legend. It's a, oh, it's a death. I mean, especially compared to the other performances that Walter did, the good ones. You know, you know when, you can make, when you can make comparisons in real time with the same artists, there's really no excuse for, for preferring something that's inferior. Well, you'll say, Ferrier is simply a matter of taste. Well, yes. I mean, it, it's all a matter of taste. If your idea of taste is things like pitch and tonal firmness and rhythm, you know, those are all matters of taste. But when you decide something that doesn't have those qualities is better than something that does, then either you have bad taste or... Or, or it's a meaningless term. The whole idea of taste is irrelevant. No, 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 no. So that Das Lied von der Erde is hugely, impossibly overrated. Oh, yeah. Here's one that I've been flogging for years. And I've even done it fairly recently, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. The Anthony Collins Sibelius Cycle. Now, this is the kind of overrated. This is what I call provincial overrated. This is overrated because, because the, the mouthpiece in the English-speaking world for classical music was largely English music magazines. But people forget, and I, I really think that you can't emphasize this enough, that England is a small country with a limited <laughs> classical music market. Even though it became the capital of the recording industry for all that time, Collins was a medium-sized fish in a little pond, basically. Let's put it that way. You know, he, he had this, this career um, that lasted for a very brief period of time. He wasn't much known outside the UK, even though he spent a good bit of his career in Hollywood. He was a very successful Hollywood film guy. But his conducting of Sibelius is just dreadful. And the London Symphony in this period is terrible. They were just a bad orchestra. So you've got mono sound, you've got just unspeakably, inexcusably bad playing, and a conductor who sometimes knew what he was doing, but just as often did not. And that is exalted as a classic historical recording for the complete Sibelius symphonies by people who, A, have not spent much time listening to complete Sibelius symphonies, evidently, B, had imprinted on those recordings, and so have a very sentimental attachment to them, C, um, have a certain patriotic or local or, or provincial or whatever you want to call it, affection for this particular guy, doing this particular repertoire. There just isn't any other any other explanation for it because they're absolutely wretched performances and that's all there is to be said for them. They are hugely overrated and I pity the people who are told to make their first encounter with Sibelius cycles listening to these abominations. It's a terrible thing to do to innocent, un, unsuspecting, budding Sibelians as to inflict these performances on them. It really is. Next, Carrion, his Debussy, La Mer, Afternoon of a Fawn, Ravel, Daphnis, and Chloe's Second Suite, and Bolero. Now, he remade this stuff. Well, he did it like 50 times, like everything he did. There was the, the earlier, earlier French stuff. There was the stuff he did for EMI. And then there was, then there was, the later digital Deutsche Gramophone thing that had the same couplings, except Bolero was replaced with the Pavan for a dead princess, or in this case, the dead Pavan for a princess. But but the the one I'm talking about is the analog middle one. And that performance is gorgeous, gorgeous, vintage Berlin Carrion. It's just not Debussy or Ravel. 
it's it's curry on is what it is. I've never understood it. There are so many wonderful performances of La Mer that have the right glitter, the right transparency, the right balance of textures. Then there's this this, this Carion performance, which is as smooth as silk and glacial, glacially cool, and absolutely, in my view, unidiomatic, timbrely unidiomatic. It's just, it's like glue. It really is. It has no rough edges. There are no bumps anywhere. It's not the sea. It's a swimming pool. It's a canal. It's a stagnant bog. Whatever you want to call it, it just, it just doesn't do anything except sit there and be pretty and say to your, and say to us, oh, look at me, I'm so pretty, it, that it is magnificent orchestral playing. I cannot dispute. It's fabulous. And this, this is one of those recordings that got the rosette in the Penguin Guide. Probably that was because Richard Osborne, who was like a, a, a curry on groupie, or one of those guys who was one of the Penguin guys, he probably insisted that it have its rosette because Carrion could do no wrong in his book. But I, I just don't understand how, in, in, in a world where you have people like Charles Munch and Martinon and Markevich and all of these fantastic people doing this repertoire in the most idiomatic and exciting way, anybody, anybody could insist that Carrion and the Berlin Philharmonic are superior superior DBC interpreters. They did a great Pelleas et Melisande. They could be. They could be, but not here. This was at the highest period of Carrion slickitude. It's, it's, it's water with an oil slick pull, poured all over it. That's what it is, and that's how I feel about it. So, that Carrion analog La Mer. All right, so what do we have next here? Oh, yes, more of the provincial type. We have to include this one, the Barbaroli Elgar Symphony Number no. 2. Now, Barbaroli was a great Elgar conductor. There's no doubt about it. His Elgar First Symphony is still a reference recording. His Enigma variations were wonderful. His Falstaff was terrific. The Dream of Gerontius is great. I mean, no, you know, there's not a question there. The problem is that with this second symphony, he insisted on making it with the Halle orchestra, his own orchestra, and I understand why. He was extremely dedicated to them. He kept them making records. He kept them employed. He kept them moving. They were a dreadful orchestra. They were England's worst provincial orchestra. I mean, you think about it. You had Birmingham with Fremo. You had Groves in the Royal Liverpool. They were all making records. They were all just as provincial. You had Silvestri and Bournemouth. But my God, they all sounded 100,000 times better than the Halle did. They just did. Barbaroli, for all that people you know, adored him and admired him, was not the, an orchestra builder, or he wasn't given the resources to build that orchestra up. You know, I always used to joke that, you know, everybody praises his tireless efforts from raising the standards of the Halle from fifth rate to fourth rate. I mean, that's as far as they got. And the Elgar II is a big, huge, complicated, difficult work. Not that they didn't know it, not that they didn't want to play it, not that they don't do their best, but it's a a dim-sounding recording, indifferently played, just as a corporate aggregate, the Halle Orchestra sounded so, so scruffy. And it's a pity. And there's a reason that EMI at the time always made sure that whenever Barbaroli had something really serious to do, he made the recording in London with one of the great London orchestras because he needed that. Even then, that wasn't a guarantee of success. But generally, he needed the best group he could get because he was kind of a big slob and he would get in there and emote all over the music and God knows what would happen. So the better the orchestra, the more guarantee you had that everything would come out all right at the end of the day. And in that Elgar too, wow, it's just so disappointing. I mean, the climax is just fizzle. Oh, it's, 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 it's. And it was very funny as I was you know, growing up reading all of the, the rationalization of how wonderful it was that he stayed in Halle and insisted on making this performance with Halle and was so dedicated to Halle. 
Yeah, he was. All of those are good qualities. What isn't good quality is the musical result in the Elgar Second Symphony. It's that simple. Overrated, hugely. Another extremely overrated performance, in my view, and not a bad one, was Andrei Previn's Rachmaninoff Symphony No. 2. This was another one of those Penguin Guide recommendations that everybody was throwing rosettes at. This one was particularly galling, not because Previn wasn't a good Rachmaninoff conductor. He was. And it's a very fine Rachmaninoff Second Symphony. It's very good. I still listen to it and enjoy it. It really was very good. But was it as great like the Kleiber Fifth? Was it as great as all that? The answer is no. And the reason it wasn't, and what made it so annoying to me, that you know, critics on both sides of the Atlantic were, were mindlessly praising this performance, was that EMI had the Timurkanov Royal Phil, Rachmaninoff Second Symphony, that they were doing nothing with. They issued it on Seraphim. It was a budgy, 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 super, super cheapy, like, let's not let anyone know it exists. And it was like twice as exciting and more passionate and more volcanic and better recorded. It just had everything going for it. It was a fabulous, and still is, one of the reference recordings for Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony. And the fact that the Previn was just sitting there reaping the accolades when Timur Konoff was, was available at half the price and had twice the, the positive qualities, it made me crazy. It made me so annoyed. And it was really probably that that more than anything else made me made me start to doubt the English critics, the gramophone critics, and these people who were supposedly the voice of classical music for English-speaking listeners. Because obviously they weren't listening. <laughs> they weren't paying attention at all. They just, they just were, were sort of mindless lemming somebody like something, and everyone else was just repeating it year, year after year in lockstep. I mean, there is so much inertia in the classical music business. So much of a tendency not to keep on listening, to make up your mind and then stop there. And that's a terrible thing. It's an injustice. It's an injustice to artists today, to the, to the greatness that's out there now, and to listeners like you who want to know what the best things are, or at least want to have an opportunity to have the right range of recordings from which you can make up your own minds. That's what I try to give you as often as not, is a range, a selection. And you can decide what you like best. I mean, you don't have to agree with me, but there is generally, uh, it's only fair to, to make a selection from various periods. And, and usually you can come up with something. It's not so hard if you've been listening. So there you go. Next, number nine in our list of 10 overrated recordings. The Van Cliburn Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto from 1958 with Kirill Kondrashin. This was the first classical recording ever to go platinum to sell more than a million copies. Again, it's a very good Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto. It really is. But you, know, and, but it, you can't d divorce that particular performance from the unbelievable political circumstances surrounding Van Cliburn's win at the Tchaikovsky competition, the whole Cold War thing, the fact that Kondrashin came over to conduct it, the fact that, you know, Cliburn's whole career was based on this, this win at the Tchaikovsky competition and on that one work, his performances of that single composition. Is it a great Tchaikovsky first piano concerto? It's a very good one. For sure, it's a very good one. It's a big, romantic, warm-hearted Tchaikovsky first piano concerto. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. But there are so many great Tchaikovsky first piano concertos and better than Clybert and exciting. You know, there was there was Horowitz with Zell. Remember that one with New York Phil? There's Argerich. There's, you know, everybody and their mother does the Tchaikovsky first piano concerto. And to have, I mean, if I had to make a short list of like, you know, if I was doing the Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto talk, you know, which at some point I'm going to have to do, I would probably include Clyburn in my top 10 somewhere. But that per that performance receives an adulation, a knee-jerk adulation, that it seems to me has nothing to do with awareness of the discography of the work in question and 
sympathetic, careful, comparative listening, especially to all of the versions that have come out since 1958, of which there have only been maybe, I don't know, two or three hundred by very, very great pianists. So there you go. The Clyburn Tchaikovsky First Piano Concerto. A, it is a fine performance, but unbelievably overrated. However, I am going to take a stab at the most overrated. The most overrated orchestral recording isn't, isn't a single one. It's a person. It's a lifetime. It's everything by Yasha Horenstein. Yes, because there is a Horenstein cult, and I grew up with it, having to deal with his name being touted about for everything from Mahler to Nielsen to Robert Simpson to, to Strauss to, to Bruckner, everybody. This was saying, you know, if Horenstein did it, oh my goodness, it was a cult classic. I got news for you. A friend of mine, a friend of mine, a critic, said, the most noteworthy thing about Yasha Hornstein is that every orchestra that he worked with made their worst ever recording with him. And I agree with that statement. That's probably true. He was one of the most fallible conductors out there. What's more, he was fallible in a very specific way. He was a fatally stiff conductor. In other words, if you were supposed to speed up or slow down or show some flexibility of pulse, he couldn't do it. He didn't do it. He just had the most metronomic stick in the world. And so all of these performances, he made his reputation, let's put it this way, doing repertoire that other people weren't doing when there wasn't very much competition and when the works weren't well known. And because he was willing to do it and was able to, you know, be reasonably average in, the, in this music and not make a total travesty of it, uh, he got a lot of credit for being a pioneer. Well, pioneers are lovely. Pioneers are wonderful. They do pioneering work. They deserve credit for being pioneers, but not for being great artists. I mean, if he was the first person to do Mahler's Third Symphony or one of the first, good for him. If he was the person who introduced Mahler's Eighth Symphony to the United Kingdom, well, good for the United Kingdom. But the rest of us ha want simply great performances of these works. There is almost not a single recording he made that doesn't have one major or minor catastrophe happening in it somewhere. I mean, he, and live he was even worse. I mean, God knows what was going to happen. I remember hearing you know, his Mahler third and, and the Mahler first, the ones on Unicorn, you know, where the timpani just like disappear at various points, where things that, you know, with weird balances and, you know, the approach was okay. The concept was okay. It was the realization that was that was usually deficient. And it was usually deficient because of him, because of whatever it was he could or could not do on the podium. And then, of course, these boxes come out of Horenstein stuff. And the Horenstein stuff is just awful for the most part. For the most part. I mean, you know, I just, I just have never heard somebody given so much credit for doing so much and have the recorded results amount to so little. So my most overrated podium human being in the history of recorded sound is Yasha Horenstein. Now, you may well ask, why didn't I mention Simon Rattle, Roger Norrington? Well, because in order to be overrated, you have to be rated. And these guys really weren't around long enough to be rated. Actually, I don't know any of their performances that have received the kind of adulation, the kind of mindless adulation that is necessary to be overrated. Well, Rattle gets a lot of mindless adulation, but, but the recordings don't stay in print and people don't talk about them. And it's really funny, Horenstein people still talk about, maybe because his recordings were of Mahler, of cult composers who have, you know, so you've got a conductor cult and a composer cult and you've got intersecting cults and, 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 and so the, the, the cult mentality reinforces itself and, and they get repeated, they stay somehow in the public eye. But, you know, Rattle's entire discography could go out of print, nobody would care. Same thing with Roger Norrington. 
Most of it already has. Do you see anybody caring? No. I don't even really see that much mention of Yasha Hornstein anymore, to be honest, which I think is a very healthy thing. I really do. But even so, even so, there's a guy who, who is, for me, the living or dead definition of the word overrated. And so that, my friends, is my list of the 10 most overrated recordings in the entire universe, or the nine most overrated. And for the 10th, you know who made it, take your pick. That's basically the way I think uh, it makes the most sense for me. Now, I know, I know you all have your own list of the world's most overrated recordings. And I, for one, would be delighted to see what it is. It's going to be very interesting because, you know, listen, it's the end of the year. It's a bitch fest. Let's just let it all out. Let it all out. I promise as long as you're not completely obnoxious, I won't delete what you send in. I mean, or I'll delete less of what you send in. Um, and we'll take it from there. I mean, the bitch fest is open. Go for it. And whatever else happens, keep on listening. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, it's been so much fun. Take care.